very happy for you uh, joining us here today. My name is Armando Berdiel, Technical Development Supervisor with Lighting Design Lab, uh, again, uh, part of Seattle City Light. Uh, very happy today to uh, introduce a special series that we're hosting uh, brought by the Customer Energy Solutions Division of Seattle City Light. But uh, we are bringing today both Lauren Baskar with DNR International and Colin Grist with Ecotope uh, on a series for commercial heat pump water heaters. Very exciting. Uh, Lauren, please take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Armando. We are just delighted to be here. And thanks to Seattle City Light and uh, Lighting Design Lab for hosting us today. A couple of quick uh, hand uh, you know housekeeping items before we start you'll notice that you have a tab uh, the handouts tab and in the handouts tab we have a uh, the participants version of this um, session this morning so you can download that to, uh, to your own computer and keep it for reference or reference it as we go through the session this morning um, we'll have everybody on mute this morning uh, but please feel free to chime in using the chat feature or we'll also be running a, a Slido app on your smartphone. It uh, doesn't collect any of your data, doesn't send you any uh, spam afterwards. It's very clean, uh, but we'd be using the, your smartphone to interact with us today as well. Um, I'll make sure that when I see your questions and comments, uh, I'll, I'm, I'm gonna turn on my camera so that Colin knows that uh, there's someone in the, the room that wants to ask something or comment on something. And so we'll uh, make sure he sees us and, and can respond to your questions and comments uh, throughout the session this morning. And then uh, we really, we have a short survey at the end uh, that gives us feedback about how we did today, what else you'd like to see from these kinds of sessions, especially about this technology that's coming to market. Um, and how we can make things even better. So we really thank you in advance for participating in the short survey at the end following the webinar. Um, looks like there will be a recording and then this slide deck will be posted on the Lighting Design Lab webpage uh, after the training. So with that, Colin, let's, uh, let's begin this morning. Thanks, Lauren. Um, glad you all are joining us here today. Once again, I'm Colin Grist, a mechanical engineer with Ecotope a mechanical plumbing and energy efficiency firm in the Seattle area. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about commercial heat pump water heating systems and why you'll want to implement them in your buildings that you're working on. My coworker, Evan Green, is going to be speaking tomorrow about how you can implement those. And so he'll be diving into more of the technical details um, and code specific requirements for getting those systems uh, successfully in your building in a reliable and efficient way. So like Lauren mentioned, we have a Slido, which is they're not collecting any data. Um, it's really simple to use. All you need to do is grab your smartphone or your uh, or on a computer and go to slido.com. And then the hashtag or the code today is hashtag YSCL. You can also use this uh, QR scanner. Um, and so if everyone could take a minute, we have an introductory survey here to get to know who is in our audience a little bit better. Um, as you know, we're presenting this remotely and it's, it's not as um, uh, inclusive or, or um, as in the classroom, let's say. So this Slido um, feature is really great for us to be able to interact with you and to get a better understanding of who we're talking to today and how we can tweak the presentation to better suit your needs um, uh, in, in the learning process. So once again, please take a minute to go to slido.com and uh, use the code hashtag YSCL uh, for our introductory survey. And one of the first things we're looking to understand is what your job title is, where you're located, um, what, what are you working on? Vancouver, Washington. Excellent. Glad you're here. Seattle. Yes, I assume we're going to have a lot of people from Seattle joining us today. That's awesome. We will definitely be diving into uh, Seattle Energy Code uh, today and more tomorrow. Energy man Management Analyst. Um, 
with Seattle and with Tacoma. Awesome, great to have you all here with us. Small Business Outreach from Portland. Plumbing engineer, awesome. Love to have plumbing engineers and designers uh, in these discussions. Um, tomorrow when we're going over the how, there's some really great material specifically directed uh, for you and your discipline on how to implement these successfully in um, multiple types of building uh, projects. Great. And so what are you all hoping to gain from today? Heat pump water heater info will definitely cover heat pump water heaters. Why you should use a heat pump water heater? Absolutely. Um, heat pump water heaters, you know, there's many reasons to use them, both uh, on the policy front and just from an energy efficiency perspective. Uh, and we'll cover a lot of that today. Hopefully, someone's looking for more info on code requirements. Yes, today and tomorrow we'll definitely cover some code requirements um, and why those code requirements are being driven. Um, absolutely, and some return on investments. We should dive into that too. So our objectives of today are to go over some global, federal, and state commitments that are driving uh, energy efficiency measures in the codes and standards we work with today. Um, we're also going to go over the advantages of a commercial heat pump water heating system because without these codes and standards, if we took those off the table, there's still many, many advantages to use a commercial heat pump water heating system in your building, even if it's not code required. But we'll discuss today that a lot of jurisdictions, including Seattle, are making these uh, code required mandatory systems now or in the future, depending on the, the building type we're talking about. So lots of advantages to use this technology and it's been around for, for a while. Um, and we'll discuss tomorrow on how to implement this technology a little bit further um, and dive into those details of what you should be aware of as the designer, or the building maintenance personnel or uh, the building owner. And then the last thing we'll discuss um, is the Seattle City Light incentives. There are still some incentives on the table today, but as these become more code mandated systems in Seattle and potentially Washington State and other areas, uh, those incentives are um, not gonna be on the table for forever. So it's good to be an early adopter and be able to utilize some of those incentives um, now, but also you know, in the future. And we'll discuss those uh, later in this presentation. So jumping right into it, um, climate change is real. Uh, I think we all recognize this now or the vast majority of society. Um, and technologies reliant on gas contribute significantly to the climate crisis. So the market is moving towards electrification backed by a decarbonized grid to try to reduce the amount of impact the built environment has on climate change and the consequences that come with it. Um, there are other reasons to do this uh, technology um, beyond climate change. There's advantages just for having it in your building as far as uh, how much you pay for your electricity use, and that comes down to your return on investment, and we'll cover that later. But 40% of the annual CO2 emissions globally comes from our buildings. And so there's a big piece of this global uh, carbon emissions pie that is directly associated with our built environment. Transportation is actually a smaller chunk of that pie, and we are electrifying our cars to try to address that. Um, but our building operations is a very significant portion of the carbon emissions uh, that, that are happening worldwide. The building materials and construction are also a big slice of that pie. That's the energy, uh, the embodied energy associated with putting these buildings together both constructing them and uh, the materials that go into those buildings. Where our building operations is more focused or is associated with the energy we use in our buildings on a daily and annual basis, right? Keeping the lights on, keeping the buildings heated and cooled 
well ventilated. That's becoming more and more important uh, today uh, and in the future. And last of all, water heating. We use a lot of energy in making water hot for domestic applications. And so we are focused today on the building operations sector um, or piece of this pie and how we can reduce the amount of carbon emissions uh, on a global annual basis with that building operations by switching to a more efficient and reliable technology like commercial heat pump water heating systems. So commercial heat pump water heating systems, they're definitely part of the solution. They are clearly addressing um, and reducing the amount of carbon emissions that are generated in the built, in, in the built environment. And so this is a low carbon technology that's much more efficient than uh, natural gas or electric resistance water heating, the two most common prevalent solutions out there today. And so we have up here on the screen a little uh, conceptual schematic of a heat pump water heating system. And we have our heat pump water heaters shown here in these green boxes, a storage tank. We have a temperature maintenance system that Evan is going to be diving into more in the, uh, in the discussion tomorrow or the presentation. And we have a, a mixing valve and circulation pump. So a lot of this equipment, right, is similar to what would be in your gas or electric resistance water heating system. And we're just switching out this um, the gas or electric resistance heater essentially with a heat pump water heater. And that piece of equipment is much more efficient and so than a gas or electric resistance water heater. So it is definitely part of the solution to uh, reduce the carbon emissions and reduce the amount of electric electricity usage in the built environment. So there are some global, federal, and state commitments that are driving uh the market towards commercial heat pump water heaters and energy efficiency in general we all know about the paris climate agreement which is to reach global peaking of the greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible and then to be climate neutral by mid-century a lot of progress is needed to get to that uh to get to that place we also have other groups and organizations such as RE100, which is over 300 international companies agreeing that we need to switch to 100% renewables and they're committing to do that um, and planning to do that uh, in their, in their, uh, with their, uh, their discipline or where they're operating. And then we also have the Climate Pledge which is over 115 companies that have uh, joined to pledged to be net zero carbon by 2040. And there's, uh, they've got great plans um, and there's, uh, I think it's like a five-step program to, to move the companies and the groups, organizations towards that goal of net zero carbon by 2040, because um, there's a lot of technical aspects that go into that and considerations. And so it's, it's great to have these organizations they are guiding us and helping us get to that goal of significant reduction in global um, greenhouse gas emissions. So the federal policies, here's uh, Biden, but I think this really should be a picture of, of us all, right? We are really the federal government. We are driving this change. Uh, we just have leaders that get to stand up in front of a podium and, and put their stamp on um, the, the pay, piece of paper. The goal, right, is to reduce carbon emissions of the US building stock by 50% by 2035. That's an ambitious target, but I strongly believe that we can all get there. We just have to be working together um, in a conscious effort to move this industry as well as a lot of other industries forward. And so right now, there are incentives for deep retrofits, which is one avenue that's going to be aiding in the progress of getting these commercial heat pump water heating systems into buildings. We can you know, utilize money on the table to help us pay for these because sometimes they are costly um, depending on the extent of the retrofit, but we all agree that we need to get there. And so there's incentives on the table and we should be aware of those and utilizing them the best we can. The other goal is to prioritize low 
global warming potential refrigerants. This is moving away from our uh, HFCs such as 134A and towards uh, CO2 or R744 as refrigerants um, in these pieces of equipment that are used uh, uh, in, in the built environment like heat pump water heaters. And then the other goal is to target net zero or zero net energy building standards. Um, this is really driving the codes and the market to push forward with more efficient building designs um, and applying codes and regulations to help designers get to that more efficient design. And this will accelerate the building code updates and provide new funding to adopt stricter building codes and train the builders and the inspectors, because I think a lot of the issues today are just the unknown around heat pump water heating or the unknown around a new efficient technology. And we need to all be trained. It can't just be the engineers. We need the builders to be on board. We need the inspectors to be on board and the building owners. So there's a big educational push um, to help adopt these codes and standards and help us all understand uh, what they are and what the requirements of them, um, of them are. So we've talked about global policies, such as the Paris Climate Agreement. We've talked about federal policies. Now we're gonna move on to some Washington state policies. Um, the goal is to shift from fossil fuels to heat pumps wherever possible. Uh, we have a relatively clean electrical grid in Washington state and a pretty darn clean electrical grid in the Seattle area. And so it makes sense to take these outdated fossil fuel or gas fossil fuel systems and switch them to electrical uh, systems that use a heat pump to move that heat instead of making it uh, and result in a much higher efficiency system while also uh, reducing the amount of carbon emissions associated with that uh, use or load. And so they're focusing on high efficiency heat pump water heaters for or heat pumps for space conditioning, which we're all pretty aware of, I think by now, those are those mini splits or VRF systems in our buildings. And they're also focusing on water heating. And this is needed because the state has these ambitious goals, which are listed down here. You know, we're getting close to this 2030 mark where we need to be 40% below the 1990 levels. And we still have a lot of, um, of progress to, to make it to that level. And then by 1990, or by 2050, excuse me, we want to be 95% below um, levels with net zero emissions by, by 2050. So um, a lot of progress to be made by then. Um, and, and, and I think we can do it, but there's going to be uh, a lot of movement in, and uh, changes towards more efficient solutions in all aspects of the built environment. And so there's other Washington commitments. One of them is the House Bill 2057, which is the Washington State Clean Buildings Act for existing buildings. And so this establishes standards for commercial buildings over 50,000 square feet. However, there's incentives for early adopters in 2021 as well for large multifamily buildings. So if there's an existing building out there that you know is an energy hog and is a rather build, big building, there are currently incentives on the table to help you make those systems and that building more efficient. At Ecotope, we've done some of these um, early adopter buildings uh, programs and just with control changes to the um, building control system, we were able to reduce the um, uh, annual energy use significantly, um, often 25% reduction just with some control changes on set points, time of use, uh, and other changes to better reflect what the occupants or how the occupants were using the building and, and um, how the pressurization and other systems were, were working and, and tuned for that building commissioned. So we have Washington State codes and standards too, right? And those standards are, you know, 
always driving the codes to a more uh, or hopefully a more efficiency or more efficient system type. The House Bill 1444 is looking at the appliance efficiency standards and currently um, appliance, appliances must meet these minimum efficiency performance levels. In the future, commercial heat pump water heaters must also meet those minimum efficiency performance levels. Um, and so this is taking, uh, you're bringing heat pump water heaters into that uh, efficiency or th those, uh, that, that standard, which requires a certain level of efficiency in that equipment. We also have the Washington State Energy Code, of course, which we're all familiar with. Um, and that um, is, Heat pump water heaters in that regard are typically used to demonstrate that buildings meet the efficiency points for new constructions. So there's um, a code section that requires a certain amount of points for a new building and heat pump water heaters or commercial heat pump water heater systems are awarded all the eligible points. And so they're often the easiest compliance option for new construction and permitting. So this uh, implementing a heat pump water heater in your building located anywhere in Washington is often the easiest, most cost effective, um, and also results in the most energy savings uh, for compliance with the Washington State Energy Code because we have to get a few efficiency points to pass that um, or to meet that co code. And then the Seattle Energy Code, our high level goals are to eliminate the carbon emissions in our buildings, right? Uh, Seattle voted on that years ago, and the Seattle Energy Code is, is pushing forward to eliminate the carbon emissions so we get greener, more efficient buildings out there um, with the goal to decrease the unnecessary electrical uses. I noted that in one of those retrofits, um, they were able to save 25% uh, energy savings with just some control changes. And, and that is that was really addressing unnecessary electrical usage. And so that's an example of um, one of those early incentive or one of those early buildings that wanted to look at how to become more energy efficient uh, to align with the state and local goals. Um, and all that was needed were control changes to do that. Uh, very cost effective, simple solutions. Um, that we're able to decrease the unnecessary electrical usage uh, for, for that building. And so Seattle's also looking at those goals and, and trying to implement that or use that as a way to get a more reliable and energy efficiency or energy efficient building stock. And so we're mainly here today to talk about the Seattle Commercial Energy Code and um, heat pump water heaters or commercial heat pump water heating systems. And so new to the code this year is this section C404.2.3, which is saying that service hot water shall be provided by an air source heat pump water heater system, not fossil fuel or electric resistance. And this is applicable to R1 and R2, which is multifamily buildings greater than three stories or any hotel or motel. This is a lot of what's been building or what's been built in Seattle over the last 10 years. And I think we're continuing to build a lot of this type of housing. And so it makes sense that um, they, the, the code, code goals align with a more efficient system like a commercial heat pump water heating system. So, um, so that's that's coming in the code in, in 2018, which is uh, the effective date is January 1st, 2022, I believe now. So I'm flying through this and um, I'll give you an opportunity here to ask some questions relating to uh, the policies, codes and standards influencing the shift to commercial heat pump water heating systems um, and how that's being adopted. Uh, by local jurisdictions. So Colin, I just want to clarify, the code itself is dated 2018, but it takes effect, you know, in on January 1st of next year for the Seattle area, which is, you know, pretty soon. 
Um, and there was a question in the chat that I know we're going to get to, but you've you know you've talked a little bit about the efficiency save you know the efficiency gained by implementing controls, right? Um, but my question is, what's the efficiency gained by implementing the commercial heat pump water heater system instead of an electric resistance system or a natural gas system? And I know we're going to talk about that in a bit, but can you just give us a general idea of what kind of uh, what's the ballpark savings there when we when we swap out an electric resistance or gas uh, based? Sure. It, uh, if we swap out a electric resistance or gas water heating system with a commercial heat pump water heating system, we're going to reduce that amount of annual energy use by two thirds. And so often the building wide savings um, on annual energy use is a 17% reduction in energy use. Uh, we'll cover um, uh, where our energy goes in buildings, whether it goes to keeping the lights on, keeping the heating and cooling system running, the ventilation system running, or domestic hot water. And domestic hot water is 25% of that um, whole, the whole building energy use. And so with applying a heat pump water heater, we can cut that down significantly and save about 17% on an annual basis across the entire building, which is enormous amount of savings uh, for just implementing one uh, technology or re replacing an outdated technology like a gas or electric resistance system with a more um, uh, newer and more efficient, cleaner technology like a commercial heat pump water heating system. Great. Looks like a, I'll let you get to all these other questions too. Thanks. Yeah, I think a lot of these we're going to be covering tomorrow um, with Evan Green, but uh, we'll try to touch on as many of these as possible. So how much electric resistance heat is allowed in backup systems and how does that affect the overall system efficiency? Yes, if we include electric resistance water heaters in these commercial heat pump water heating systems for backup, or to treat a specific load, that will definitely increase the uh, electrical usage and result in a decrease in overall system efficiency. And so we have to be very conscious about that. Uh, the code looks at your heat pump water heater capacity and says that your electric resistance capacity can't be anything larger than that. And so they don't want you to put in a very small heat pump and a very big electric resistance water heater and you tell them that you're running on that heat pump but in reality you're running on both and using that electric resistance water heater a lot to meet the primary water heating load. So um, that's covered in the code and we can talk a little bit more about those specifics tomorrow. Uh, water source versus air source, especially considering drain wastewater heat recovery. Absolutely. We've had some success in the Seattle area using a water source heat pump water heater to extract heat out of the wastewater stream and put that heat into uh, domestic hot water. That has worked pretty well. It's uh, probably one of the more if, uh, expensive systems, but there are some advantages, um, especially where there's air temperature concerns uh, with heat pump water heaters because they can only operate down to a certain temperature depending on the type of refrigerant used in that heat pump water heater. And we'll cover a little bit, uh, we'll cover that in depth tomorrow on refrigerant selection and the air temperatures that, that they can operate in. How do you implement code required dual fuel heating with commercial heat pump water heaters? Um, I'm not entirely sure on that, and so we'll see if we can get someone from Seattle City Light or uh, to, to address that question either today or following up uh, later. Because gas is so much cheaper than electricity, at least for now, correct, at least for now is the key word there. Should the customer expect to save any money with retrofitting from gas to even water heating? Yes, if you do it correctly, you can definitely save um, on your operational costs when switching from gas to heat pump water heater. Now you can save, and it, and definitely when gas gets more expensive in the future, you will be able to be able to save uh, additional additional money from switching. So, Colin, another question that came in the chat here. Um, 
uh, Seattle Energy Code 2018 C404.2.3 <laughs> requires air source water heating for R1 and R2, but is this the same requirement for all new construction for commercial buildings? So right now, uh, commercial heat pump water heating systems are just required for that multifamily building type or R1 and R2 and hotel. Um, in the future, uh, they will be required for all buildings is my understanding, um, but that would go into, into effect later in, in the future. Did I answer that question? Was there a second part to it, Lauren? All right. So we, talk, we talked about the code driving um, the market towards commercial heat pump water heating systems because society is looking to reduce uh, humans impact on climate change and to reduce the climate crisis that, that's coming or is here now. Um, and those are changes that, you know, collectively we are telling, um, you know, the, the people uh, in power writing those rules and jurisdiction or rules and codes that we want more efficient systems, we want uh, better buildings, and, and we have codes and standards that are uh, addressing those to help guide the industry towards those better, more efficient, more reliable um, systems. But there also are other advantages to commercial heat pump water heaters beyond that, right? They're climate friendly technology, meaning that most of these systems or the newer equipment coming out is using refrigerants, which are less harmful to, to the environment um, if leaked out or, or when they're leaked out. We also have proven performance of commercial heat pump water heating systems for over 10 years. And we'll get into some case studies or some really light case studies on some of the successes there. There are also lower, or they result in lower operating costs compared to electric resistance and about the same or lower compared to gas water heating systems, depending on how efficient your um, commercial heat pump water heating technology and system is. But commercial heat pump water heating systems also allow for grid flexibility, and we'll get into this a little bit further, but time of use rates are coming, right? Our electricity right now is essentially one standard um, rate dollar per K-dub, but in the future, uh, Washington State will likely adopt time of use policies just like California has adopted them, where at certain times of the day, electricity will be more expensive than at other times. Commercial heat pump water heating systems can be designed to take advantage of that to only run during times where electricity is cheap on the grid and still provide hot water to the occupants at all hours of the day no matter when they require that um, water heat. And then we'll go over the simple Im implementation um, of these technologies. Uh, they've been around for a while. They're just really unknown and uh, not very well understood right now, but they're proven systems that have you know, been, been implemented um, and the technology has been around for, for a very long time, the vapor compression cycle of, of a heat pump itself. And then the other thing that commercial heat pump water heating systems are addressing is the demand for sustainable housing. Um, this is a huge growing uh, market demander um, and we're seeing more and more sustainable housing designs out there as well as more programs um, and uh, platforms that help the resident or the future resident of that building determine if they want to rent or not, depending on how sustainable it is or how much energy their uh, monthly utility bill will be predicted at. So some huge advantages there to really put yourself and your building on the forefront um, and, and, and capture uh, some of that um, great marketing that goes with energy efficient buildings. 
So I said it's a climate friendly technology. And one of those reasons is because it's moving heat, not generating or making heat. And it's much more efficient to move heat than to make heat. And so a heat pump water heater moves heat using the vapor compression cycle or the heat pump cycle. And that's essentially taking a source of air, capturing some free or low cost heat out of that air. This could also be a source of water, but we're focused on air today. Um, capturing that heat out of the air, then we can compress it to bring it, our working fluid, our refrigerant to higher temperature. And that's where we put energy into the system. Then we can uh, dump that energy out of the system with our condenser to hot water, go through an expansion valve to get to the same uh, state or to re uh, reduce the pressure, right? And then we go through the evaporator again, which is where we're capturing um, free or low cost heat. So what happens is we get about two units of, of free low cost heat by taking it from the air. Then we put one unit of, of heat in or work in for our compressor. And that allows us to dump three units of useful water heat or useful water heating energy out into our storage tank or to our building. And we expand and go to, back to the same place. And so this process is, um, is much more efficient because we're moving that heat and we get two units of free in, pay for one and get three out. Uh, and so that's really the magic of the heat pump water heater and other heat pumps. Heat pumps aren't new to us, right? We have them in our car, we have them in our refrigerator or in a kitchen, and we might have them in the space that's being heated and cooled right now. Your refrigerator takes heat out of the insulated, melt, insulated box and dispenses that heat to the kitchen environment. That process cools the refrigerator. That's a heat pump, right? We also have heat pumps in our car or air conditioners. They're taking heat out of that car and dumping it back to the environment. Heat pump water heaters are really just working in the opposite way or opposite cycle. They're taking heat out of the air and dumping it into water instead of taking heat um, out of the air that you're in and trying to dump it to an external source. So that process of moving heat is much more efficient than making heat. And that's the magic right there behind heat pump water heating systems. Um, much more efficient than your gas or electric. Your gas water heating system or your electric water heating system, which is making heat or generating heat, is often taking one unit of energy and burning either a gas, a flame, or your electric resistance coil and returning you 0.9 to 0.8 units of useful heating energy. So operating closer to 80 to 90% efficiency in uh, comparison, the heat pump water here is operating closer to 200 to 300% efficiency and sometimes higher if you do a really, really good job on your system design. So these are also climate friendly technologies or they're becoming more and more climate friendly. A lot of our heat pumps out there today are using um, HFC refrigerants such as R410A and R134A. But the industry is moving towards these um, refrigerants with lower global warming potential, GWP. Uh, closer to one is, is CO2 because that's what the system's based off of but that is also known as R744A. So it's more efficient to move heat than to generate heat. And also our technologies are getting better at this while using um, refrigerants, which are more environmentally friendly uh, or more climate friendly, we'll say. Um, and there's also propane, R290, which is, is uh, sometimes used you know, in your gas propane grill but can also be a really good refrigerant, especially for heat pump water heaters. And so although um, there's some issues around the use of propane right now, uh, I believe that, that that might be a great future refrigerant that we start considering again in a lot of these um, uh, mechanical pieces of equipment we're, we're specifying for our buildings. 
Um, there are also some um, impacts on the air temperature that these various heat pumps can operate in. And Evan Green is going to give a, a great overview tomorrow um, on the air temperature ranges and, and the efficiencies of uh, these heat pump water heaters, depending on what type of refrigerant is used in the device. And so that will be some really good information out there for uh, the energy analysts and, and some of the plumbers to help realize what the limits of the technology are and the capabilities are as well. So there is a question on um, energy savings relative or how much energy can we save, right? Here we have two pie charts. Um, one is our baseline multifamily building, which is uh, just our basic multifamily building standard um, with a less efficient water heating system and, and very little efficiency measures. And then on the right hand side, we have our multifamily building with a heat pump water heating system. And so you'll notice that there's two pieces of the pie here that are associated with uh, with the mess hot water usage. We have our primary heating load, which is about 15% of the total, and our temperature maintenance heating load, which can be up to 10% um, or even greater of the total annual energy use. The primary heating load is what you think it is. It's making cold water hot that the occupants use. The temperature maintenance load is keeping that water hot in the distribution piping and in your tanks. Um, so that when an occupant turns on the tap in a larger multifamily building, they don't have to flush a bunch of cool water out of the hot water pipe before they get hot water. So we circulate water in, in our hot water piping typically to um, keep that water hot close to the end use fixture, but that means that there's a heating load associated with that and it actually is pretty substantial. If we apply a heat pump water heater correctly and efficiently, which we'll give you some more tips on tomorrow, we can significantly reduce the amount of energy um, used in our domestic water heating system and save about 17% on average, which is an awesome amount of savings for one technology being implemented, um, often in you know, the basement mechanical room or around the roof of the building. This isn't like your envelope where you're touching every square foot of the outside of the building. It's a very confined system that we can essentially replace the engine of and get a much more uh, resilient and efficient system than, than we had before. So uh, Colin, I just wanna, um, I, know, I know the short answer here to this question, but just quickly. Can you convert refrigerants over time so that if you started out with an R134A system and you wanted to convert to a low global warming potential system like a CO2 based system that you could just swap out the refrigerant in that same system? Uh, you likely can't swap out the refrigerant in that same piece of equipment, um, but you could essentially swap out the piece of equipment to a more efficient uh, device. So if you have a R134A heat pump in your building now, in the future, you could potentially swap that piece of equipment out after you know 20 or 30 years when it's at the end of its life and replace it with a more efficient uh, uh, heat pump water heater that uses a CO2 or a different refrigerant. Great. And I just want to do a time check. It's 1044 and uh, we have quite a bit more to go. So just uh, so you're aware. Cruising on. Yep. So we want to get into um, some case studies to show you all that this is demonstrated, it's proven performance. Um, there are some things you need to be aware of, but you can be successful with implementing commercial heat pump water heating systems uh, and reduce the, the amount of energy used by two thirds in your building. And that's about 15 to 18% over the entire building, which is pretty substantial. So the first one we'll cover is Sunset Electric. This is in the Seattle area, right by the East uh, Police Precinct. Um, and this is a five floor apartment building over one floor of retail, and one and a half floors of parking. There are 92 residents uh, or residential apartments. There's more residents in the building. 
And this is using a central 134A air source heat pump water heater located in an underground parking garage, right? That's the key there. Um, Evan will cover more details on the refrigerant tomorrow, but R134A has challenges working below about 35 degrees Fahrenheit. And in Seattle, it gets cooler than that. So we put it in a parking garage, which is ventilated and underground. And that underground parking garage stays above 40 all year long, no matter if it's 23 degrees outside for a week or, or longer. And so that was a great success we had. Um, this building's been operating for years now, and it's a 70% reduction in the domestic hot water usage here. We see our 2030 baseline challenge, and then this is our Seattle mid-rise normal, and here's the Sunset Electric actual energy usage, actual energy usage. So we took that EUI or energy use intensity, how much energy per square foot of building area we use on an annual basis from 39 to 22.7, uh, which is uh, a great, great way. And once again, this was just with the commercial heat pump water heating system and a few other efficiency uh, measures. Um, Hope Work Station, another uh, more recent case study that's been developed or been, uh, been implemented. Um, and this is using semi-distributed CO2 heat pump water heaters on the roof or the Sandin Sanco 2 system. So we have uh, a bunch of risers in this building and we essentially put a small uh, CO2 heat pump water heater and storage tank on each one of those hot water risers. And so it's acting as a semi-distributed or a zonal central heat pump water heating system that dramatically reduced the temperature maintenance load for the, uh, the losses associated with keeping the water hot in the piping. And so once again, a 75% reduction in domestic hot water use um, on an annual basis, a great story to report to all of you. Um, and it's also awesome that this is serving low income uh, folks um, who, who should be provided with very energy efficient systems. Uh, so we have our graph over here and you can see the hot water is noted there and we see that substantial drop in energy use. And we also applied some other energy efficiency measures um, like heat, pump, heat pumps for space conditioning and um, low lighting power densities throughout the building. Uh, new construction, definitely possible, but it is also possible in retrofits. So here's uh, Elizabeth James House. It's in the Capitol Hill area of Seattle, or just south of it. And it's a 60 uh, unit senior facility um, serving low income again. This project had about 40, 40, 40 tons of electric resistance water heating in it, or capacity in it. And we reduced that to four CO2 sanding units which are about five tons total. So we reduced the 40 tons to five tons. And that wasn't because of the technology, that was just because we looked at the building load and what act or how much water they actually use. A lot of our sizing estimates on older buildings or retrofits were based on higher fixture flow rates. So the um, people doing the, the math behind how big the water heater needs to be, was based on more water than we typically use. And so in a retrofit situation, it's often cost prohibitive to replace gas or electric resistance equipment, like for like in capacity. But if you actually look at the water heating load and size your new heat pump water heating system for that load, plus a little bit, you result in a much more um, energy efficient system that is actually uh, financially feasible. And so we did that at Elizabeth James, reducing the total capacity from 40 tons to five tons, still meeting the water heating load at all times of the year. And that ended up saving the occupants 6,000, about $500 per year, which comes out to a hundred bucks per tenant that, um, that they're saving. Uh, a great story to tell. And all that was done here is essentially taking those sand and heat pump water heaters 
and putting them upstream of the electric resistance water heating, heating system. And there's a cost comparison. Um, there's a, a note or a question on return on investments and first costs. And so I have a slide here on comparing costs. Uh, heat pump water heating systems definitely result in lower operational costs compared to electric resistance water heating systems, right? We take our powered by the same source electricity. One operates at a efficiency of 300% heat pump water heater. The other operates at an efficiency closer to 90% electric resistance water heating system. So there's dramatic savings there. Compared to gas, they're not as favorable right now, but gas prices will increase in the future. And they're definitely will be increasing substantially as we uh, put less gas infrastructure in uh, the streets and neighborhoods. Um, because that's a huge financial uh, or a huge source of, of revenue for those, those companies. And so gas prices will go up, they might skyrocket. Um, and so we will definitely see some operational savings in the future compared to gas, but right now it's a neutral cost. Here is a really awesome graph uh, someone at Ecotope put together. And it shows your central heat pump water heating system and the installed cost per unit normalized there. And we have a rather large rain right, range right now because it's an unknown technology. And if you're, you know, if you know how to do it, you put a low bid because it's easy for you. And if you don't know how to do it, you put a high bid because there's some uncertainty and challenge that you'll probably run into. Central gas, um, same thing, pretty widespread because there's a lot of, you know, different sizing and, and other considerations that go into those buildings. Uh, but in general, this, this is a little bit lower of an operating or an installed cost per unit than, than your heat pump water heater. But if we compare it to individual heat pump water heaters, right, we're going to have a higher cost. Individual gas is, is really high. Um, and then multiple central heat pump water heaters, we can bring that low or about the same level as the gas, um, as a central gas system. So there's ways to basically bring your first cost down to at or below the um, your your first cost for a gas system, as well as um, there's ways to dramatically or you will be saving more energy or more more dollars on an annual basis using a heat pump water heating system. And I'm going fast here just because of uh, time. There's a lot of, to pack into to one hour. But um, the other advantage that I noted early on is grid flexibility and time of use rates. Uh, they're coming. They're here in, or they're in California right now. Um, and, and they likely will be spreading to the all across the West Coast here soon as our grid is tied together. So if we save energy here, it helps California and other states. And if they save energy, it's, it's helping us. So it's likely that the time of use of that electricity will also be important in the future. Heat pump water heaters, because um, of their system design, they can be designed, or because of their system, or some of the system aspects of a heat pump water heater, they can be designed to shift out of your peak time of use pricing rates. So you see this orange line here is when people are using water in the building, we have two days here there's 24 hours so the first day right morning rush second day or in the evening we use some and we don't use much overnight and then we use it in the morning again and in the evening and we can design our heat pump water heating systems to essentially turn off or be, be designed to be not running during these peak time of use pricing however we do need to then run them you know overnight and so this is a great uh, aspect of commercial heat pump water heating systems that can be implemented um, as a future proof, future proofing um, uh, aspect of your building to one, really reduce the amount of uh, the amount you're paying for your energy and to reduce the peakiness or the peaking plant usage on the grid because this peak time of use pricing is often associated with us turning on the peaker plants so that we can meet the higher demand for electricity on the grid 
and those peaker plants are typically less efficient than, than the baseline uh, energy generation systems. So CTA 2045 is something that you should be aware of and know about. This is allowing the heat pump water heater system to be connected to the grid so that you can design your system to capture these uh, lower time of use, um, uh, lower time of use prices. And then there's also demand for sustainable housing. I know a ton of people that are uh, renting housing or looking at buying housing right now. And um, a lot of them are asking me questions on, hey, is this efficient? Is this an efficient mechanical system? Is this gonna drive me crazy? Um, is this overly complicated? But there's also um, you know, online platforms and bigger organizations that are uh, looking at this and trying to be market differentiators. So stream belt on apartments, uh, one in Seattle, right off of 99, lower Queen Anne area, right on their cover page, right? They say that built 100% net carbon neutral, and you can learn what that means. So this is definitely a marketing strategy right now and will only be a stronger marketing uh, strategy in the future. There's platforms that are um, helping us as renters or people looking to buy homes to distinguish what is efficient and what's not because often you're not going into the new apartment and tearing down the wall to see whether they have R13 or R21 bats in that, in that wall, right? So Rent Lab's mission is to drive efficiency, sustainability, and affordability in the rental housing market through data transparency. So they're coming up with these awesome little sheets, um, one pagers on, you know, what are the, the, the smart living features, your bike score, your walk score, I won't go over those, but also whether it has inadequate insulation or um, how efficient it is, right? And so the market's driving to this, there's more data available to all of us um, today and there will, will definitely be more in the future that's helping us make these good decisions um, that are leading us to the more efficient uh, technologies and solutions. So from a marketing perspective, there's definitely reasons to implementing uh, commercial heat pump water heaters in the buildings that you're working on because they're gonna be uh, great uh, marketing sources now and in the future. So how do we get these systems into our buildings? Um, right now we are have been operating in this custom engineered world where we have multiple pieces. We might have a heat pump, a storage tank, a backup water heater, a mixing valve, all coming from different distributors or sources. And so this is custom engineered and often tricky. And you got to get an engineer involved in making sure that it's specified right and, and controlled right. That's being moved um, further towards these fully specified and built up systems. Uh, more like what's available now in the in, on the gas or electric resistance water heating front but all of this is pushing towards these fully packaged or skid mounted systems uh, which have all the controls the heat pump the expansion tanks the storage tanks already built up on a skid and this is really reducing the cost associated with these systems because we're taking a lot of the labor out of the field and putting it into factories, um, which can, can help drive down the cost. So it's great to see that in the market, we're moving away from these more expensive custom engineered systems to these fully specified built out systems or the fully packaged system. And by fully specified out and fully specified built out system, um, what I mean is that there's typically one manufacturer or distributor helping you um, put all the components of the commercial heat pump water heating system together. So your heat pump, your storage tank, your hot water circulation pump, and any backup or controls that you have in that system. The other great tool that's available right now to everyone here is the EcoSizer. This is a sizing uh, tool for commercial heat pump water heating systems serving multifamily buildings and it will soon be designed to serve other building types um, like office, school, retail. 
And what you need to do is put in the occupancy, how many people are in the building, how many apartments are in the building, the amount of water those people use per day, and it will spit out um, a curve and some suggested uh, sizing guidelines. And so you can change where you are on that curve to meet a given load. All you need to do is be above it and you'll, you'll meet the load on a daily and annual basis. So you can go to ecosizer.ecotope.com and get free access to this tool. It's super user friendly and, and really helpful to help guide um, your selection and size right because we all know that heat pump water heating heat capacity is expensive and so we want to minimize that first cost in the system and the ecosizer definitely helps you do that. The other thing that's uh, really new and on the forefront um, and I'll let Lauren touch on this too is these educational modules that uh, we're creating with with uh, the DNR team. And these are online on-demand modules that cover various aspects of the heat pump water heating system and can be tailored to you if you're the building owner versus you if you're the plumbing designer of the building so that you just see the course modules that will be interesting and influential to you and your design or, or your desires um, when, when specifying these systems. Awesome, Colin. Yep, yeah, that's very true. And I'll put my uh, email in the chat. These are going to be ready by uh, early November. So we're looking to launch all of these online educational modules for, for everyone in the audience and, and other folks that you might know that might be interested. Great. So quick recap, because we're already one minute over, but um, there's 10 years of proven performance uh, with multiple manufacturers, multiple heat pump water heating technologies, both air and water source. Um, there's multiple building types and technology and configurations, uh, and we're going to dive more into that tomorrow. Um, these are climate friendly technologies and solutions. There's more uh, technologies coming with lower global warming potential refrigerants. So that's going to be even more climate friendly when, when we get to there. Um, and then they're comparable or lower first in operational cost. So from a first cost and an operational cost standpoint, it's advantageous to switch from your outdated fossil fuel gas water heating system to a higher efficiency heat pump water heating system or your electric resistance water heater to a heat pump water heater. And then this also addresses the demand for sustainable housing, right? We saw that we use a lot of energy with heating water, 25% on an annual basis. And so we can address that simply, effectively, and quickly with just switching out the heat engine uh, to a heat pump water heater, which is much more efficient than some of the other outdated technology. And then simple imp implementation. For the past 10 years, this has been more complicated, more complex, custom system designs. Uh, the market is really, really moving towards these um, kind of off the shelf designs, solutions, so that you as the designer understand the system and have uh, people to stand behind you um, when, when issues arise uh, and also to, to aid you in making sure that you get the most reliable and efficient system uh, in your building. And uh, pause here for questions or maybe just move to the end because we're, we're kind of at the, the end of our time. I'll leave this CLC light incentives up on the board because this is probably interesting for all of us here. Um, there are still incentives available. You should be focused on the CO2 heat pump water heating system because you can get some great incentives right now uh, with that higher higher efficiency technology. Um, and Colin, these are good for 2022. So this is the these are the incentives the Seattle City Light team provided for us uh, for 2022. So still getting incentives here for central systems with a COP above two or with the CO2 refrigerant. Yep. Great. And still incentives for uh, retrofits, which is awesome because we need to be making all those existing buildings more efficient. And that um, brings us to our concluding slides. And so 
commercial heat pump water heating systems are needed now because we have societal shifts that are driving towards a more efficient technology, a more sustainable world, so that uh, seven generations from now, we have people inhabiting a beautiful Garden of Eden rather than a, uh, uh, some other world that was created. And then we also have a unique value proposition, right? Um, there's proven performance. These are climate-friendly technologies. There's great marketing in this. Uh, and we can also save on our operating costs and our first costs. So great reasons to switch just from a value proposition. And then um, we can capture incentives still. Like uh, Lauren just noted, those are the 2022 Seattle City Light incentives. So there's great opportunity to um, save some money and, and uh, make sure you get that return on investment. Uh, Here's some resources. Um, check out. Uh, this will be provided in the handout. And then I'll pass this off to Lauren to um, summarize the upcoming trainings and uh, future resources. Yeah, definitely. So we're super excited to be collaborating further with Seattle City Light and the Lighting Design Lab for upcoming instructor-led sessions. You'll see those in the top right-hand corner. Uh, another one coming up here in October 11th and 13th, really a deep dive into those engineering uh, design considerations and then followed uh, later in the month by design maintenance and operations, both great classes. And again, please, if you're interested in these online modules that are coming to market here uh, right at the beginning of November um, or to host a training session, please contact me directly. And uh, my email is in the chat and here as well in the handout. Thank you. Great, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, Please feel free to reach out to CL City Light 2. Uh, click call and connect. And then a big thanks to our uh, collaborators, the Advanced Water Heating Initiative, um, the Lighting Design Lab, CL City Light, uh, BPA's Emerging Technologies um, platform. Great. And thanks to everyone who uh, held on just for a little bit over time here at 1107. Colin, thanks so much uh, for delivering some great information today. We all yeah. look forward to everyone coming tomorrow also for more of an engineering look at how these systems are integrated into their buildings. Um, yeah, we want to thank us. Please join yeah. us for that because there's going to be some great, uh, more detailed information on, on really how to apply these successfully in your buildings. Yeah, awesome. Thanks again to Seattle City Light and the Lighting Design Lab. We really appreciate the opportunity to be here today with you. And we'll sign off there. Thanks, Armando. Thank you, everybody. It's been great. Won't keep anyone any longer. Thanks a lot. Have a good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>